So thank you very much for the, <coughs> for the invitation and giving me the opportunity to present my, my work. Um, so the uh, topic that I will talk about is entanglement and coherence and quantum state merging. Uh, this is a joint work um, of myself and uh, co-authors from, uh, from ICFO in, and um, also with Andreas Winter from uh, uh, University, um, uh, so Autonomous University in Barcelona. Um, and um, so it will be very related uh, to the first uh, talk today, uh, to the resource theory of coherence that I will also briefly re uh, review. Uh, but um, I will not talk so much about uh, this generalized uh, resource theories of superposition at this moment. Okay. So um, in the first uh, part of the talk, I will, um, I will tell you some uh, results about the resource theory of quantum coherence. So we will talk about incoherent states and incoherent operations. Um, we will talk about how to quantify coherence, and um, we will also talk about quantum coherence and distributed scenarios. This is related, uh, this is very much related to entanglement, uh, to local operations and classical communication, but more uh, with respect to quantum coherence. And in the second part of the talk, I will um, um, present uh, the results, uh, so which is uh, related to quantum state merging. We will talk about standard quantum state merging, which was already presented uh, more than 10 years ago, and uh, we will talk about uh, the incoherent version of quantum state merging where these concepts of coherence uh, come into the, <coughs> into the game. Okay, let us start with the first part, the resource theory of coherence. Um, and um, again, this is very much related to the first talk that we, um, that we had today. Uh, so we have a quantum state and we call it incoherent if it is diagonal in some preferred basis. So if it is a sum over i, p, i, and some states i, and uh, if a state uh, is not of this form, we call it coherent. And the set of all incoherent states is labeled here by a calligraphic i. <clears throat> and uh, this goes back to the group, uh, to the group of Martin Plenio uh, a few years ago. And uh, there is uh, an article by myself, Gerardo Adesso and Martin Plenio that is about to be published in reviews of modern physics. So a quantum operation is called incoherent if it can be written as in such a form. So we have here a lambda applied to rho, and it acts here with a Krauss operator. So a Krauss operator multiplied with rho, and then a Krauss operator dagger. And uh, as uh, we ha uh, heard in the first talk today, uh, these uh, Krauss operators have to fulfill this incoherence conditions or the Krauss operator applied on each of the uh, of a diagonal states must produce a diagonal state. This means that such quantum operations, so this, this overall um, procedure is a quantum operation, and such quantum operations cannot create coherence even if, if you know the individual outcomes of your measurement, because every quantum operation can be interpreted as a measurement, at least in principle. And I here labels the outcomes of the measurement. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> There are other frameworks of coherence that are discussed in the literature that are slightly different from, from the framework introduced by Martin Plenio and his group. And I will review on this slide the most important frameworks, uh, but I will not go into much detail because there are actually at least 10 different frameworks that are currently discussed in, uh, like in the last two years. So one of them is called maximal incoherent operations. Uh, this was introduced by Johann Oberg uh, more than 10 years ago already. And uh, this is actually the most general set. These are quantum transformations which cannot create coherence in general. So you apply a quantum transformation onto a diagonal state, and it gives you a diagonal state. This is the most general set of transformations that you can have in any reasonable resource theory of coherence. <clears throat> Because if you have a state which, uh, if you have a transformation which does not even fulfill this, this would mean that you can create coherence out of a diagonal state which doesn't make any, uh, much sense if you talk about the resource theory. Uh, there is a second approach called strictly incoherent operations, which goes back to Andreas Winter and, and independently uh, to the group of Vladko Vedral. And uh, so these are operations which, uh, for which the uh, Krauss operator dagger are also incoherent. This sounds a bit mathematical, but it turns out that this 
definition has some nice uh, leads to some nice properties, which are which is not represented by the by the standard framework of Martin Plenio. Uh, the third um, approach are called translational invariant operations, and these are quantum transformations which commute with time translations. Meaning, you have such a time time translation here. You apply it after um, after your quantum operation lambda, and it commutes. So, meaning that if you first apply the time translation and then lambda, it gives you the same result. And uh, this is just a nice uh, definition by symmetry. So you have some, some symmetry here, and uh, it turns out that such uh, transformations are closely related to the framework of coherence. For example, such transformations cannot create off-diagonal elements in a density matrix. <coughs> uh, another nice definition is dephasing covariant operations. These are quantum operations which commute with dephasing. So lambda, uh, del delta here is a dephasing operation, meaning it removes all, all of the diagonal elements of your density matrix, and it, it doesn't matter if you apply delta before or after the lambda, then in this case, then lambda is dephasing covariant. And again, if you look at these two things, uh, they are, these are definitions by symmetry, as I would call them, and also this is somehow these operations can also not create coherence, so these are, they are closely related to the other frameworks of coherence that I have presented here. So, uh, but just, this is just to give you a, a short overview, because there are at least uh, four or five more definitions that are discussed in the literature, but we don't have time to go through all of them. Uh, so, uh, it's just uh, to give you a flavor of what is going on in this uh, research area at the moment. So, um, the... <clears throat> Uh, once you have defined your appropriate framework of coherence, you would like to know how to quantify coherence. So if I give you a state, what, uh, um, yeah, we would like to have a number, as, uh, as we have heard today in the morning, we would like to have a number that labels, uh, that quantifies the amount of coherence in a state. And uh, the, um, so this number C should have the following properties. It should be uh, greater or equal than zero, and it should be zero if and only if your state is diagonal. And um, uh, the number should not increase under, under incoherent operations. So the, uh, you, if you apply an incoherent operation to your state and calculate the coherence, uh, then it should not be larger than the coherence of rho. Sorry, uh, one says if and only, that means that, you, uh, that there is no, no such concept as bound coherence. Yeah, usually, uh, yeah, this is a good question. Uh, that's right. Uh, so usually, in, or in most frameworks, or in all frameworks that we know today, uh, there is no bound coherence, yeah, so thank you, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the many coherence measures uh, are also monotonically non-increasing on average under selective incoherent operations. So meaning that uh, you, perform, you perform your measurement with individual cross operators not creating coherence and give, you get some, some probabilities QI for the outcome I and some post-measurement state, sigma I, uh, here, and then if you average the coherence of these outcomes, you, uh, this average is not larger than the coherence of the initial state. This was also mentioned today in the morning. <clears throat> and this is actually closely related to the framework of entanglement quantifiers. So if you, uh, where you had, uh, yeah, the, uh, where, where, where this would be E instead of C, so quantify entanglement, you would ha find very similar conditions there. So, uh, and uh, this was a very abstract notion of coherence quantifiers, but uh, what are the actual examples? So there are two um, important examples for coherence quantifiers. This is, uh, the first one is called coherence cost. And coherence cost quantifies the asymptotic rate of maximally coherent states. So these are maximally coherent states here, uh, which is required to create a state row via incoherent operations in the asymptotic limit. So for those who are familiar with entanglement theory, uh, this would be entanglement cost and entanglement theory. And uh, we can actually write a, a formula for that. So the coherence cost is actually equal to the coherence of formation. And the coherence of formation is the minimal average coherence of a state. So this is a, uh, con a so-called convex, um, convex roof function. So this is um, sum over i, pi. And here you, we have c of psi i, and this CR will be defined on the, on the next slide, actually this is the relative entropy of coherence. It's actually just the entropy of the diagonal elements of this guy. So, uh, so this is coherence of formation, and it turns out that it's equal to the coherence cost. 
Um, the second important uh, quantifier is distillable coherence, which is kind of uh, dual to coherence cost. So the distillable coherence quantifies the maximal rate for extracting maximally coherent states via incoherent uh, operations in the asymptotic limit. And for this quantity, we actually have a closed expression, which is a bit surprising because of the definition uh, looks um, not, not so easy, but uh, we have a closed expression for that. And the closed expression is that it's the entropy of the diagonal elements of rho minus the entropy of the, the whole state. So, uh, so delta here is the dephasing operation, meaning removing of diagonal elements of your matrix. And this, uh, these results here are, go back to Andreas Winter and Dong Yang uh, from last year. Okay, um, and of course, uh, these uh, quantities also depend on your framework. So the, uh, here, the formulas for coherence cost and the stealable coherence apply uh, only for the incoherent operations of, the, of uh, Martin Plenio and his group. But uh, the, um, if you apply a different notion of coherence, as I have discussed on the previous slide, then uh, the amount of the stealable coherence and the amount of coherence cost change or can change in general. Okay, <clears throat> uh, there are also other coherence quantifiers that are also <clears throat> have also interesting features. One is the relative entropy of coherence, which is just the relative entropy between rho and uh, the set of uh, diagonal states. And it turns out that this quantity also has a closed expression and co coincides with distillable coherence. So it's just, again, the entropy of diagonal elements of rho minus the entropy of rho. And uh, last but not least, I would like to mention the robustness of coherence, which goes back to Gerardo Adesso and his collaborators. So uh, this is um, defined as uh, you, uh, the minimum over tau, uh, and you minimize uh, the quantity S uh, under a constraint that is larger than zero, and you have the additional constraint that uh, the R plus S uh, tau divi divided by one plus S, so this is just, uh, uh, kind of uh, normalization, so you normalize this whole thing so that it's trace one, and uh, you require that this uh, guy here is incoherent or is diagonal. So, and uh, the minimal s for, for which for which uh, this occurs is is your is called your robustness of coherence, and the it has actually operational interpretation via interferometric visibility, as demonstrated recently uh, here uh, by Andreas Winter and collaborators in this publication. And uh, this quantity, or a similar quantity, also, is also known in entanglement theory under the name robustness of entanglement. OK, um, so I hope uh, I have given you an introduction to the uh, resource theory of coherence. Uh, and now we go to, um, to the next level. We go to coherence in distributed scenarios. And <clears throat> what does it mean? Um, we remember um, LOCC operations from entanglement theory. So these are local operations and classical communication, as we heard also today in the, in the morning talk. Uh, so, and uh, similar to these LOCC operations, we can introduce local quantum incoherent operations and classical communication. And this means uh, that instead of general quantum operations locally, we require uh, that we only perform incoherent operations locally. And apart from it, we also have a classical telephone. Uh, and now um, I will give you some features of this operation or some properties of, of them. So these LQICC operations, they preserve the set of quantum incoherent states. So you have such a state, um, which is called quantum incoherent, and it has this form. So it's a convex combination here of states sigma i on Alice side and i on Bob's side. So these states i are incoherent, they are diagonal. So this is the important uh, uh, difference to entanglement theory. In entanglement theory, you would have a general state here on Bob's side, side, and then you would call this state separable, but here we have only diagonal states on Bob's side. And, um, <clears throat> Uh, a classical, uh, or here a quantum classical yeah. state would be, um, would allow for a unitary rotation of the basis additionally here. You would allow to have any basis, but, uh, but in our case, in, in these uh, states, we have a fixed basis because we talk about uh, coherence theory where we always have a fixed basis. Uh, 
So this basis is fixed through the entire uh, discussion. And uh, so this, uh, to be more precise, uh, this set is a subset of qu uh, quantum classical states where you would um, yeah, allow additional unitary rotation here. Thanks for the question. And uh, the second feature of this uh, LQICC operations is that they cannot increase the QI relative entropy. So the QI relative entropy is a new quantity here. It's defined as the minimal relative entropy between rho and such states. And it turns out that it also has a, um, like a closed expression, which is it is the entropy, the von Neumann entropy of rho IB after performing dephasing on Bob's part minus the von Neumann entropy of the overall state rho IB. And oh, this quantity is important because it's a monotone under this LQSC operation, so it cannot increase under such operations. And uh, it has found uh, many applications uh, in the tasks that I will discuss over the next, uh, yeah, over the rest of the talk. And uh, also, this, uh, this quantity is actually additive in the input state, so which makes many, many things uh, easier to evaluate. Actually, um, yeah, so this quantum uh, coherence and distributed scenarios has been introduced by myself and, uh, and co-authors in these two papers, and also independently by, by the group of uh, Vlad Kovidrat here. Okay, uh, <clears throat> let us now uh, present, uh, talk about an application of, of such a framework. Uh, so the first application is called Assisted Distillation of Quantum Coherence. Uh, this is the task um, where we have two parties, Alice and Bob, and um, so who share a bipartite state, rho AB, and uh, the aim is to asymptotically distill a maximally coherent state on Bob's side via the operations that I have discussed before, so via LQICC operations. And uh, so we, we would like to know how much, uh, how much of the states can Bob distill asymptotically and uh, how is the, the difference uh, to, to the other, uh, like to the standard distillation procedures in coherence theory. So, and the figure of, of merit here is the distillable coherence of collaboration. So it's called distillable coherence of collaboration because you can see this task as, uh, as, as a task where where Bob aims to distill coherence while getting help from Alice. So th that's why collaboration. So we have two parties who are collaborating, and uh, yeah, one of the parties aims to distill, to, to increase his amount of coherence locally. And uh, it turns out that the distillable coherence of collaboration, so here, this is the distillable co coherence of collaboration, is bounded above by the relative entropy, by the QI relative entropy, which had a close expression as I have discussed on the previous slide. So it's von Neumann entropy of this guy minus the von Neumann entropy of the total state. And uh, even more uh, interesting for pure state, so if you have a pure state here, then it's actually equality, meaning that you have, uh, we have solved this problem for pure state. So if you have a pure state, the distillable coherence of collaboration is equal to the QI relative entropy, when, again, which is equal just to the von Neumann entropy of the diagonal elements of Bob's local state. So, meaning that for pure states we have solved uh, this problem of assisted coherence distillation, and we would like now to compare how this quantity differs from the case where Bob just distills coherence locally without getting assistance from Alice. And uh, so, if, just Bob, if Bob just runs the standard distillation procedure locally, then he can distill a coherence at the following rate. It will be the en von Neumann entropy of his local uh, uh, state, the diagonal elements, minus the von Neumann entropy of the state. And you, if you compare these two quantities, you see that uh, here we subtract the von Neumann entropy of Bob's state, where here we don't do it. So meaning that this quantity is larger. This means that by getting assistance from Alice, Bob can increase his distillation rate exactly by the local von Neumann entropy of his state, which is uh, uh, surprisingly, it is ba uh, this quantity is basis-independent, meaning that the improvement of the protocol is basis-independent, although the framework of coherence is basis-dependent. And uh, last but not least, I would like to say that uh, this has been, um, so there, there has been an experiment performed on assistance co coherence distillation here by, uh, by a group of Guan San Guo in China. Okay. Um, 
let us now come to uh, stand, uh, to quantum state merging and to uh, so where we will also apply the results of uh, LQICC operations and the overall framework will also be applied to this task. But before we do it, let us first talk about standard quantum state merging. Uh, so standard quantum state merging was introduced here by Michal Horodetsky, Jonathan Oppenheim, and Andreas Winter um, in 2005. And it's, uh, it can be seen as a game between three parties, between Alice, Bob, and the referee. They share a joint state, and um, yeah, they share many copies of a joint state psi. And uh, the aim of the procedure is to give a least part of the system to Bob while preferring, uh, while pres preserving the total state. So this means that the total state uh, psi R B B prime should be the same as psi R A B up to relabeling A and B prime. So the in other words, you, uh, you'd like to, to give Alice part of the system to Bob while preserving the correlations with the referee. And um, <clears throat> so in order to be able to do this, Alice and Bob need to have entanglement. And if they have entanglement, they can do teleportation for doing it, but without entanglement, they will not be able to do it. And um, in, the, in this paper, the authors studied how much entanglement is actually needed for this procedure, and they found out um, they found the minimal number of uh, singlet rate needed for this procedure. And the minimal singlet rate is given by the conditional entropy. So the conditional entropy between A, Alice and Bob is given by the von Neumann entropy of Alice and Bob minus the von Neumann entropy of Bob's local state. And <clears throat> uh, this quantity can be positive or negative in quantum theory. So, and if, if this quantity is positive, uh, then um, the, uh, Alice and Bob can achieve quantum state merging with singlets at this rate, and if they have singlets with, uh, uh, if they have less singlets, they cannot uh, do quantum state merging. And if this quantity is negative, then merging is possible without singlets. Um, so Alice and Bob can do quantum state merging just by local operations and classical communication. And additionally, they will get singlets at a rate which is given by the minus of this quantity. So, in other words, uh, this quantum state merging gives uh, an operational interpretation for uh, the conditional entropy, no matter if it's positive or negative. So Which, the the sorry? The the uh, singlets are uh, with two parties. It's a bipartite. So, singlets are yes. shared by Alice and Bob. But state yeah, yeah. It's quantum state merging from Alice to Bob. Yeah. So the merging procedure merges to Bob. It's asymmetric, yeah. So the final singlet states remain the Bob? No, no. Singlets, uh, if I say singlets, I mean uh, between Alice and Bob. Because the local singlets do not have any meaning in entanglement theory. So it, it's uh, between, singlets between Alice and Bob. Thank you. <coughs> OK, um, so and now uh, we will discuss the difference of standard quantum state merging and incoherent quantum state merging, which we introduced here. Um, last year. So in standard quantum state merging, we talk about shared entanglement. So this refers to your question. So shared singlets. Uh, and they are considered as an expensive resource. But um, in standard quantum state merging, local coherence was available at no cost. So the parties could, could produce local coherence arbitrarily and not take it into account anyhow. So, but in incoherent quantum state merging, as, as we presented here, we also takes, uh, take Bob's local coherence into account. So we, we, don't, we don't assume that Bob can produce arbitrary amounts of coherence locally, but take it into account explicitly. And uh, so in, in more mathematical terms, we have a state, rho RAB, shared between Alice, Bob, and the referee. And we consider quantum state merging via LQUICC operations and um, where additional singlets and maximally coherent states on Bob's side are provided at uh, rates E and C. So E is the, the singlet rate between Alice and Bob, and C is the amount or is the coherence rate um, that Bob has locally. Oh. And um, so we are interested in optimal entanglement coherence pairs. So these are pairs of entanglement and coherence for which merging is possible, but uh, you, uh, where E and C cannot be reduced. So if, uh, this means if you have such a pair, 
you know that you can do quantum state merging with entanglement at this rate and coherence at this rate. And uh, the main problem is to determine all such optimal pairs for a given state. So, uh, uh, so we have given a quantum state and we want to know for which entanglement and coherence pairs we can do quantum state merging. So, and it's a, it's a difficult question, but we, th so this is what we have attacked here, what, what we have tried to solve. So, <clears throat> and uh, one of the th main results of, um, of this paper is uh, the following theorem. So given a quantum state row RAB, any achievable pair must fulfill the following inequality. So entanglement plus coherence must be greater or equal than the von Neumann entropy of this quantity. So this is the state row RAB, so the overall state. And here you apply a dephasing operation only on Alice and Bob part. So you deface Alice and Bob part, but you don't deface referee. And Uh, the rates. The rates. So, so, the, so this is the rates, the required rates. Uh, so meaning that, so this is the uh, asymptotic number of uh, two qubit singlets uh, per copy of the of the state. So you have many copies, and per copy of the state, this is the number of two qubit singlets, and this is the number of single qubit maximal coherent states per copy asymptotically. And uh, these are, so these are the rates, and um, they are greater equal than the uh, von Neumann entropy of this quantity minus the von Neumann entropy of this state, again with the dephasing operation, but only applied on Bob's part. And uh, <clears throat> so again, here a bit more explanation. S is the von Neumann entropy, and here this delta x denotes full decoherence or full dephasing on a, on a some subsystem x. So uh, this is how you would apply it. Let's say. Uh, on, uh, uh, to be a bit more precise, so you, you apply projectors here Ix uh, that operate in row, and again here Ix. So. And um, what can we conclude from this result? Uh, so after looking at it for, for a few minutes, you would realize that this quantity is actually non-negative. So this right-hand side is never negative, and, um, and because of this, uh, so the sum of entanglement and coherence must also be non-negative. And uh, this means that no merging procedure can gain entanglement and coherence at the same time. Why, Why is it like that? It, it is because if entanglement is negative, uh, th this means that you can do quantum state merging gaining entanglement. If coherence is negative, this means you can do quantum state merging gaining coherence, but they cannot be both negative at the same time. So you cannot run quantum state merging and gain both entanglement and coherence. If you gain Entanglement, you have to provide coherence, and if you gain coherence, you have to provide entanglement. Okay, um, <clears throat> if we have a pure state, uh, we have uh, the following bounds. We have um, here, uh, the entanglement is bounded above, uh, bounded below by the conditional entropy. Uh, this is the result of um, Horodetsky oppenheim minder and this is our result. So the entanglement plus coherence is bounded above by Actually, this is also the conditional entropy. If you look at these two quantities, they are basically the same up to the fact that we have dephasing here. So this is the conditional entropy of the dephased state. Yeah. Uh, and this bound is achievable for pure states, meaning that if we have a pure state, then quantum state merging can be done without coherence at, uh, by using entanglement at exactly this rate. So C0 and E is exactly this then. Okay, um, so this is the, uh, the plot of uh, achievable region. Here E0 is the amount of entanglement that you use uh, for, for merging without coherence. Um, <clears throat> so E min is the horodetsky oppenheim inter bound. That means that if you have uh, entanglement less than E min, you cannot, uh, you cannot merge no matter how much coherence you are provided. And here, uh, what we still don't know and what would be very interesting is Cmax. Cmax is the amount of coherence that you need for merging at, at the minimal entanglement rate. And um, because we don't know this, we also don't know the, the region here in between. So um, yeah, this would also be very interesting, but we just don't know how it looks at the moment. Uh, <clears throat> For some mixed states, we can actually solve the full problem. So for example, if you have such a state, uh, you, can, um, you can find all optimal entanglement coherence pairs, but because I don't have so much time, I would like to 
jump over it and go to the next example because um, we have a very very nice uh, uh, very nice open question that I would like to present and uh, so there is some evidence that a large amount of local coherence can be saved by using little entanglement. That means that imagine you have um, you have a state where you can do quantum state merging with some entanglement and a, a large amount of local coherence. And uh, we have uh, <coughs> some evidence that also instead of this large amount of local coherence, you could just increase your entanglement just a little bit by some epsilon, and this would reduce your coherence dramatically. And um, so one uh, example where uh, I believe uh, that such, uh, such um, phenomenon can occur is this state. So you have here a referee, which is just given by some flags. This dB is a very large number, is a very large dimension of Bob. And uh, phi i a are two qub uh, a single qubit states of Alice. And here we have mutually orthogonal, maximally coherent states on Bob's side. And uh, if you think about it a bit more, this state can be actually merged without any entanglement if Bob just applies a local measurement, but for this he would need a large amount of coherence. On the other hand, the state can be merged without any coherence on Bob's side by just teleporting Alice's system to Bob, and this is one qubit. So this can be done by just using one singlet, or alternatively, no singlets, but a large amount of local coherence. So I think this state is a good example for demonstrate such effect, but we, this is just a hand-waving argument we cannot prove. This, uh, we cannot prove that uh, the procedures I, talked, I told you are optimal. Okay, let me now summarize. So we have introduced the task of incoherent quantum state merging in which entanglement and local coherence are a resource. Oh, we have showed that entanglement, <clears throat> we have showed that entanglement and coherent sum in this procedure is bounded below uh, by this quantity. And uh, this implies that no merging procedure can gain entanglement and coherence at the same time because this quantity is non-negative. So the bound is tight for all pure states. Any pure state can be merged without local coherence by using entanglement at exactly this rate. And these results imply an incoherent version of Schumacher compression. So this is a point that I didn't mention during my talk so far. So it means that the von Neumann entropy of the diagonal elements of rho is the optimal compression rate for a quantum state under the assumption that the decompression has to be performed via incoherent operations. So if you look at this, uh, this entropy is larger than the standard compression rate. The standard Schumacher compression rate is just the entropy of rho, and this quantity is larger. And this is because of the restriction that we assume that the decompression has to be performed in the incoherent way. That means that in general, at the decompression level, you need coherence. Uh, so this, uh, the results I was talking to you about are uh, published in this, uh, in this paper. And uh, yeah, the, as I also said, um, there is a recent review on quantum coherence as a resource um, that uh, will appear in the ref mod fees uh, probably next week or even this week. We'll see. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs>